morning as we continue our series on the book of Revelation. We've been looking at the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2 today, and Jesus begins writing this letter to the church at Ephesus with these words. He says, to the, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. You know, the first three verses of of our text for this morning, as Jesus is describing the church at Ephesus, everything looks pretty good. This is, I mean, for all accounts in those few verses that we just read, a very good-looking, strong church. In fact, They were doing everything right. Everything that a Christian is supposed to do, everything that a church is supposed to be, that's what we read about in the book of Ephesus. Think about the things that that, that Jesus commends them on, the five deeds that that he says he's recognized in them. First off, he says they're hard work. They they were dedicated. They were hard working to the cause of Christ and, and going out and spreading the gospel and serving the Lord. Second thing, he says that they had a lot of perseverance. They were faithful to him. Even though they'd, they'd gone through some struggles, even though they'd gone through some persecution, you know, they were persevering through that and, uh, and were sticking faithful to Jesus. Third, he says that they were not tolerating wicked men. Now, if you go on in our text and get to verse 6, it it also adds that they they hated the practices of the Nicolaitans, which were a pagan group from that day. So, you know, they they didn't put up with folks uh, disparaging the name or or defaming the name uh, of Jesus and, and, and by their poor character. They didn't put up with that in the church. The fourth thing, he says that they had identified false teachers. They had marked them. So this was a doctrinally sound congregation. Uh, they, they stood on the word of God. The fifth thing that he says that they had going for them is that they had endured hardship for the name of Jesus and they had not grown weary. So they had undergone this persecution in the name of Jesus, but they hadn't given up. They had, they had stayed faithful to the cause. Now, you look at those first few verses there, and this church was a church that was doing everything right. I mean, they had it all together. They were both doctrinally and morally sound, and there's not much more you can ask. There's not much more you can ask from a church than that. But they did have one problem that Jesus addresses in the next verse of our text, verse 4. And that's that everything they did, they did it without love. Look at verse 4. Jesus says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Now, all the good that they were doing, they were doing it all without one key aspect. They were doing it without love. That means that everything they were doing, they were doing without the proper motivation. Now, all we've got to do is look to our Heavenly Father for the motivation He has in doing the good that He does. You know, as, as a Christian, the best thing that we're going to look at God that he's ever done is certainly saving us. That's obviously the most gracious, the most merciful, the, 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 the goodest, the best, you know, the most wonderful thing that God has ever done is to save us. And in John three sixteen, probably the most familiar verse in all of Scripture, we're told God's motivation behind his saving us, his reasoning behind wanting to save us. It says, for God so loves the world. It's his motivation was his love. For God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God saved us because he loves us. And as Christians, we're called to serve God out of a love for him. Remember what Jesus told us to do in the Gospels? He told us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. The motivation that we're called to have when we go out and serve God is we do so, we serve Him because we love Him. That's always to be our motivation. Now, if these Christians in the church at Ephesus, if they were serving God, but they didn't love Him, they had some other source of motivation here. And I've been trying to rack my brain around it. We're not told what their motivation was, but the only thing that I can figure is that they were serving God strictly out of a religious ritual. It had become a ritual to them. They had gotten in the habit of doing it, so they just kept doing it. And they kept doing it in the name of Jesus, their service, their meeting together, their their, their giving to others, their their helping one another out. Even the character that they seemed to have had, 
They weren't doing it out of love. They were just simply doing it because they had always done it. Look, that's always a threat to the church. That's a threat to any church. It's a threat to any Christian. Any time we step back and examine ourselves as a congregation, or any time we step back and examine ourselves as individual followers of Jesus Christ, and we ask ourselves, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I saying what I'm saying? Why are we singing the songs that we're singing? Why are we doing this ministry? Why are we involved in in that different program? And the reasoning is, or the answer to our question is, because we've always done it that way. Anytime we ask ourselves why we're doing this and that's the answer is because we've always done it that way, then we are headed down a dangerous path. And we're on a slippery slope that can lead us to an absolutely terrible place. The church in Ephesus, they were serving God. They were doing all the right things, but they were doing it without love. They were doing it in a loveless way. And that almost sounds impossible to do. But you know what? If, If you look at it, we see the same thing in human relationship all the time. We see that same thing happening in marriages all the time. Every one of us has known a couple that has been married for years. Sometimes it's five or ten or, or 40 years, and they're, they're going through the motions. They're doing everything right. They're serving one another. They're living together. But somewhere along the line, they've, quote, unquote, fallen out of love with one another. You know, they got married, and, and, and they settled down, and, and then somewhere along the line, they got lazy in their love. And we hear it from the husband if you're a guy or maybe you're a lady and you, you know, you're at the barber shop or, or the beauty shop getting your hair done. And you hear it from that lady who's sitting in a chair. But for whatever reason, they quit trying to woo each other. They quit dating each other. They quit being boyfriend and girlfriend with one another. And they're just this old married couple that's living together now. But that, that, that's about it. You know, he quits treating her like the queen that she is. She quits treating him like the the king that that he is. He quits dating his wife and, you know, settles down and gets him a beer gut. She trades in the the little nighties that she used to wear for the the grandma gown. You know, and and they're they're living together and they're kind of going through the motions of marriage. But there's no love. There's no love in their relationship. Now, love is not just some fuzzy little feeling we get in our gut. That's not what love is. I know a lot of times in America, that's kind of how it's depicted. But that's not what the Bible teaches us at all. Love's a verb. Love is an action. It's a decision that we make. You know, it's a decision that we make in a mindset that we're called to have. So that old married couple or that couple that's been married for a few years and they, you know, they've fallen out of love, they can decide to rekindle that love for one another, but it's always going to take some work. It's going to take some work from both parties. You've seen it in, in, in people's marriages, but I tell you where else we can see it is in the church, in our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we have forsaken our first love, if we've fallen out of love with Jesus, we've got some work to do to get it back. We can put in some work, thankfully. God's given us a little prescription here uh, in, in verse 5. He gives us a prescription for some work we can do and regain that love that we initially had for him. If you have your Bibles open to Revelation 2, look at what Jesus says in verse 5. He says, remember the height from which you've fallen, repent, and do the things do the things that you did at first. There's three parts there to that little plan of, uh, of action for getting our love back to where it needs to be with Jesus. First thing he says that we need to remember. Remember back to how things used to be. Oh, this, this is good stuff. Do you remember that feeling you had the day you became a Christian. I still remember the relief I felt the day that I became a Christian. I came up out of the baptistry and, you know, and dried off, and I had some family and friends there. And all, when all that was over, I remember just kind of sitting there by myself, and it was, a relief, it was just this feeling of great satisfaction and relief just to know that I was saved, just to know that, you know, when I die, I'm going to get to go and be in the presence of God. And the natural response to that is just worship. You know, it's just to worship him and thank him. And I remember in those early days of, of being a Christian, just going home. And, you know, I grew up in a preacher's house. We were at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And, you know, we, we, it wasn't unusual to be around the Bible. 
But just being a new Christian, I went and just poured my heart and soul into reading God's word and praying. And it was all new. It was all fresh. And what Jesus is telling us to do is, hey, look, if you've fallen out of love with me, if you've chosen not to love me right now, but serve me anyway, go back and just remember how that used to be. Remember how those early days in your faith were. The second thing he says to do is repent. Now, here's what repentance is. It's not simply being sorry that we've not loved Jesus for a while or or we've stopped loving. Instead, the definition of repentance is a change in our mind that leads to a change in our action, what we do. So for this church at Ephesus, they found themselves serving Jesus even though they weren't loving him. And and what, what Jesus is commanding them to do is to change their mind and get to work to start loving him, to start doing these things that, uh, that, that are going to renew their heart for him once again. Now, th- they had to be committed. There had to be a commitment level uh, to putting in the work to doing this. But then this final thing here, and this is, this is where it all comes home, is Jesus says return. Return to doing the things or, or, or go back to doing the things that you did at first. He tells them to, to remember what it was, to repent, get that mindset right and ready for the actions to go. And he says, now return to the things that you were doing at first. Do the things that you did at first. This this is the section of our life when we were kind of dating Jesus. You know, or, or we, had, we had first started our relationship with him. He says, do those things that you did at first. Well, what did you do when you first got into that relationship with Jesus? Uh, you spent a lot of time with him. And it wasn't just a lot of time at church. You know, it wasn't just that time with other Christians. It was that alone time. You know, it was that getting in the car and riding down the road and turning up the radio and singing your heart out those songs of praise to God. It was spending that time alone with him where you were allowing him to speak to your heart through his word. It was that time where, you know, you get off by yourself and you pour out your heart to him in prayer about everything that's going on in your life. That's what he's talking about. You know, it's, it's the same thing as marriage. It's the exact same thing as marriage. I remember when my wife and I, when we first started dating, and then even when we first got married, we enjoyed being around our friends and family. We enjoyed that time together. What we enjoyed even more than that was when we weren't around them, and we were just together, and we were alone, and we could talk to one another, and we could we could connect with one another, and we could learn one another, and we could kiss one. I mean, we you know all that kind of stuff. And, and what 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 you what you're gonna do? is if you're going to keep that, keep those home fires burning, keep that love going in your marriage and in your relationship, is your relationship can't just be public, it's also got to be private. And and that's what Jesus is calling the church to do. You know, there's a reason in our marriage that there are nights that we send our kids to bed earlier because I just want to be with Fran. There's the reason that we send them to the grandparents' house or somebody else's house for a little bit every once in a while so we can just go on a date together and and just go out to eat and just be together alone with one another. That's what Jesus is calling this church to do to rekindle their love for him is to just spend that one-on-one time just with him. It's good to be with the church. It's essential to be with the church. But if that's the only time you're ever with Jesus, If that's the only time you're spending focusing on your relationship with Christ, there's not going to be much love there. You've got to have that one-on-one time. Look at what he says in the the last half of verse 5. He says, remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent, do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from, from its place. Remove your lampstand from its place. Now, if you go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, We're told that the seven lampstands represent or are symbolic of the seven churches. Jesus said he's he's among, he's walking among the seven lampstands. That means that he's there. His spirit is among the churches. But if they didn't repent from this sin, if they didn't get back to serving him out of the motivation of love, then he was going to remove their lampstand from its place. You understand what he's saying? is that he was still going to be there, but they weren't going to be there. They weren't going to be in his presence. That lampstand would be removed. In other words, they would cease to be a church anymore. They might continue to meet. They might continue to meet in his name. 
They might continue to go through all the motions. But unless they returned and got back to loving him, they were going to cease to be the church because his spirit would no longer be, it would no longer be in their presence. You know, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's a, that's a familiar passage of scripture. We look at it, you know, just about every time we have a wedding or around Valentine's Day, you hear it a lot. It's the love chapter. Well, that chapter begins by telling us that if we don't have love in our lives, we're two things. We're, we're a, we are a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. You know what that is? Nothing. If we don't have love in our lives, we're nothing. And without love, without love, the church, it becomes nothing. It stops being the church at all. Look at verse 7 of our text. I hate to end on a negative note, so let's look at verse 7. This is good stuff. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You know, if the church in Ephesus was to regain their love for Jesus, if they were to repent of their loveless actions and get back to being sold out to him and devoted to him from their heart, and, and, and they went back to loving him, he was going to bless them with access to the, the tree of life. Now, this is such a beautiful picture. It's, it's a picture of the beginning. It takes our minds all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and, uh, and 2 and 3 where we see Adam and Eve and they're there in the garden with God. And they, they have access to the tree of life. It takes our minds back to this, this beginning where man was with God and his relationship was, with, was what it was supposed to be with. You know, he was walking with God. He was talking with God. He was always around him. He was living with God. And that's what Jesus says will happen if we love him if we serve Him and, and we love Him, is that we can, when we return to our first love, He blesses us, He blesses us with His presence in our lives. And ultimately, we get to be blessed by being in His presence for all of eternity. And this is such an amazing promise. Even if we've messed our relationship with Him up, even if we've We've messed up with God and gotten to the place where, yeah, we're doing the right things. Maybe you're coming to church every time the doors are open. Maybe you're reading your Bible. Maybe you're doing the right things, but you're doing it without love. Even if we've messed those things up, if we repent and we start loving Him again, He says He's willing to take us back and He's willing to give us that home in His presence in heaven. It, this whole thing reminds me, this whole chapter reminds me of, of an old hymn that we've, we've probably all sung when we were kids growing up in, in the church. The hymn, Oh How I Love Jesus, and the words are so simple. But it's the message of our text here in Revelation. It says, Oh how I love Jesus, oh how I love Jesus, oh how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. We've got a lot of reason to love him, but none greater than the fact that he loved us enough to die on the cross for our sins. To buy, our, to buy our, our heart. To buy our salvation. To present to his Father in heaven. God bless you. Good morning, Gold Point family and Junior Church kids. I'm so excited to bring you another lesson on this idea of the fruit of the Spirit. Before we get started with the fruit of the Spirit, the, the, the lesson time in the biblical part, let's play a little game first. We're going to play the same game we've been playing. Uh, the difference is this week is that some of these, you're going to think, they're vegetables, but really, they're actually fruit. You ready? Here's the first one, the first clue of this. Name this fruit. It is colors of, individually, they could individually be green, red, orange, or yellow. They're not, this one fruit is not all those colors at one time, but they can individually be those colors. Colors of green, red, orange, or yellow. Here's the second clue. Sometimes you can stuff this, um, this fruit. Sometimes you can stuff this fruit with different things. Here's the next one. The last one is you can cut this fruit up into other dishes. So you can cut this up into little pieces and put them in other dishes. Do you know what it is? If you said a bell pepper, you're exactly right. Good job. Here's the second one. Name this fruit. This fruit is long and green. 
This is long and green. There's a lot of seeds in the middle of this, um, of this particular fruit. And the last clue, this fruit is also in a salad. It is cut up in little, little, uh, little pieces and is in salads as well. Let me give you one more clue. It's so good with ranch, it's delicious. If you guessed a cucumber, you're exactly right. Good job. Here's the last one. Name this fruit. This fruit is orange. This fruit is also either very big and heavy, or you could choose to have a smaller size. But most of the time, this fruit is very big and very heavy. You may not even be able to pick one of these up by yourself. And the last one is, or the last clue is, you carve these during Halloween. Can you guess what it is? If you guessed a pumpkin, you're exactly right. Great job. And as we get ready to start, we're going to look at this next word of the fruit of the Spirit. This word is goodness. You see, there are so many times when we use this word goodness. You may say, oh my goodness. Or, if you use the smaller word, sometimes when you, when, you, uh, when you may leave or when your parents may leave you, maybe with your grandparents or whatever it may be, they, they use the small word up there and say, you better be, you better be good. And so as we, uh, as we look at this word goodness, we're going to see that it doesn't only mean your, yourself should be good, your, the, the way that you should act should be good, but it's also your actions that you do as well should be good. And so as we get ready to look at this, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13 through 16. And it starts out by saying this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it become made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, there are a lot of things that have salt in them that you may not even know that salt's in. This right here... Is a little salt shaker. As you eat your food, you want to make sure that you, well, you don't want to make sure, but you may want to add some salt to it. In biblical times, there's three, not only three, but there are three main things that, that they use salt for. The first one is for wounds, for, they, for like a cut on the arm. It, it'll help heal the healing process of the, the wound that you may have. The second one is preserving things. They would put it on meats and stuff like that to be able to save the meats longer because of the salt. And, and then the, the third one is the taste. It, it's, high, it's the good taste of what salt is. Have you ever had some lace chips, some plain lace chips? Sometimes they taste so good because of the salt. And so as we look at this passage, we see that there is a, there's a purpose for salt. That there are different reasons why they use salt. And, and what Jesus is saying here is, if salt loses its saltiness, that meat will rot. Your, that wound won't heal as quick, or maybe won't heal at all. Or maybe it's the idea of if you taste it, it may not taste good. And so, what, what Jesus, in some ways, is talking about here, is he's using this example of the purpose of salt. The, the purpose of salt is so important, that it does its job, that it does what it's supposed to do. That it is good to eat, but it's also good to preserve, and it's also good for wounds. In the same way, he says this, he says that the salt, if it loses its saltiness, it's no good. In the same way, I think, I think a good way of using this as an example is our purpose in life. You, you know, if we're not actually doing the purpose that God has created us to do, uh, maybe it's helping somebody or or, or, or being good, as we talked about, or whatever it may be, if we're not doing the purpose that God has created us to be, then I think we need to figure out what that is. What that purpose is, and being able to do that purpose that God has created us. The reason that God created us. We each have different gifts and abilities, and we've talked about that before. And because we have that, we can all work together. And as we do, we use our purpose that God intended us to have. And so, the idea of salt, salt is important, just as you are so important, so important to me and to a lot of other people. And so, salt, don't lose your saltiness. And so, here we go, Matthew 14, let's look at this, 
It says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. It says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under their bowl. Instead, they put it in, on its stand and gives light to everyone in the house. Let me explain. In this room right now, there are lights going down this way. There's also lights above me. And so these lights help shine down onto either me, so you can see me from the, from, the, uh, from the video camera. Maybe it helps with the lights that are in the TV, helping you be able to see what the TV says and what, what, it's, what, it, what you can read on the screen. Light is so important. As you get up maybe in the middle of the night to, to go get a snack or use the restroom, you, you may turn on a light. The idea of a cell phone with a flashlight. There are so many different ways that we see that light's important. Right here, I have a replica. Replica meaning that it's not an actual one that they used back in the day, but it's one like it. What it is, it's made out of clay. And so, it's a candle. Right here is where you put the, the, the oil. And then the wick would come out of here. The oil will be soaked up by the wick. And then you would burn the, the, the wick and oil together. And it will light up. Here, if you look, oil here, and then the wick comes right out here. It's just like a candle at your house. And so, what Jesus is saying here is that, is that you don't light this candle or one at your house and put it under a, a bowl. You don't, you don't put it under, under something where you don't use it or you don't see it. You hold it out. You maybe put it on its lampstand and let it stay, stay up high so then it can shine light. To the everyone in the house. You see, the salt has a purpose. The light has a purpose. It helps you see. And so, as we, as we shine our lights, we go, we're going to see in this next passage that we need to shine our lights to others. Look at this in verse th uh, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others. That they may see your good deeds. And... Glorify your Father in heaven. In the same way, let your light shine before others. That they may see your what? Your good deeds. So not only do we need to try to be good, right? Be good in the sense that, 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 we, that we try to help others and guide others. And, and being able to do good in the fact that, um, and, and the way that we act and the way that we do things. But we also need to worry, not worry, we also need to know that our good deeds are important as well. Why? Because um, they glorify your Father in heaven. You see, when we do good things for different people, and we do good things for, uh, to two different people, they may think to themselves, man, that, that young kid or, or whoever it may be, is raking up my leaves. Or maybe after the hurricane this last, this last couple of weeks, maybe they thought, wow, that was really generous of them coming and picking up my limbs. Or, or whatever it may be, but it's the good deeds. And it's not for us to get the, the gratification. It's not for us to get the, the good job. But it's for our Heavenly Father to get the good job. They may even ask you the question of, why are you picking up my yard? Like, why are you picking up these pine cones or these limbs out of my yard? Why are you mowing my grass? Why, why are you helping me with, you know, whatever it may be? And you could say this. You could say, because my Heavenly Father loves me, so I want to show you that love as well. You see, it's those good deeds that we can do. Not for our own benefit and our own honor and glory, but for the glory of of your heavenly Father in heaven. And so things that we learned this week and goals of this week is this. Number one, in a good way, be salty. Meaning, be who God created you to be. Be that purpose that God has created you to be. In the same way, be the light. Meaning, do good to those around you. Do good to those who, who, who uh, maybe your neighbors, or, or as we talked about before, not only our neighbors, but our neighbors, everybody. And the last one is this, not so we can be glorified, not so, so we get the, the, hey, good job, but so that God is glorified. And so as we get ready this week, go ahead and try these three things. In a good way, be salty. Be who God has created you to be. Be the light. 
do good to those around you. And the third one, not so we can be glorified, but by, so that our Heavenly Father can be glorified through us.